welcome back. If you're just joining us, my name is Kirsten Kim. I'm the Paul E. Pearson Chair in World Christianity and Associate Dean for the Center for Missiological Research here at Fuller Theological Seminary. All of our plenary keynote speakers from this week are joining us now to discuss migration, transnationalism and faith in missiological perspective. We have focused on Los Angeles and California as a crossroads of migration. And we, well, I certainly have learned a lot about Los Angeles, even though I live here. But the issues raised and the insights shared are also transferable to other global contexts. We've heard several aspects of the multifaceted relationship between migration, faith and mission from our speakers and respondents. I've made a list of nine different connections. Um, first, how mission can be understood as migration. Go into all the world, as Bishop Zach reminded us, or the Protestant errand in the wilderness of Dr. Dochuk. It is celebrated, migration is celebrated as how Christianity became a world religion. But second, on the other hand, the effects of migration and mission are in many cases damaging and traumatic. For example, Dr. Rojas Flores' description of the experiences of Latino children and Dr. Smith's of the California Mission's treatment of Native Americans. Third, how different waves of migrants and missionaries have perpetrated injustices on others. Remember the questions about citizenship and belonging raised by Dr. Sexton and Dr. Smith. How migration challenges people of faith about their attitudes to others and their sense of identity. And we can remember the dialogues between Dr. Dochuk and Dr. Ramiro and Drs. Kim and Lee and how race especially has come to the fore in our discussions. Fifth, how migrants and those who work with them are inspired and sustained by faith and spiritual resources. We heard concrete examples from Dr. Kassam and Dr. Kamink, and also in the first practitioner panel and in the breakouts of how Christians are um, and people of other faiths are working with migrants and across faith boundaries. Num uh, number six, how immigrant faith impacts the existing faith and mission landscape. So Drs. Flory, Dochuk and Kim highlighted the religious innovation of migrants, new churches, new missions, new ways of doing things. Seven, how forces of migration and globalization forge new transnational and global ways of being community. The in-betweenness as Dr. Martinez called it and Catholicity as we heard from Dr. Campese and Dr. Robeck how mission practices such as hospitality and protest can address the suffering caused by forced migration and the injustices of immigration systems, as we heard from Dr. Salvatierra and the practitioners in plenary two and in the breakouts. And number nine, lastly, how we might shape a mission theology of migration. Dr. Crouch suggested biblical material just now and Dr. Sanchez developed a model of vocation. And Dr. Campese suggested a culture of encounter and synodality. So welcome back to all our distinguished keynote speakers who have formed this panel to debate with each other and with you all. We have met Drs. Campese, Dochuk, Flory, Kassam, Kim, Martinez, Sanchez and Sexton already so I shall not introduce them again. You can find their bios on the Hoover speaker page. My colleague and co-organizer of these lectures, Dr. Salvatierra, is also part of this panel. To begin the discussion, I have asked each of the plenary speakers, plenary presenters, to take two or three minutes to tell us a highlight of this week for them. While they're speaking, do post your questions in the session Q&A because we will turn to these next. If you wish, you can direct them to particular panelists or to the whole panel. So presenters, 
Shall we go in alphabetical order? That means Dr. Campese, it's your turn. So good morning again to, to everybody. It is a pleasure to participate to this final panel of the, the missiology lectures. Uh, really a greeting here from Rome. It is evening here, but not too late. Eh? It is uh, just 7, 7 p.m. And um, I'd like to start my, my, my first, my, the first thing that, that I want to say, and uh, it, it is about the city of Los Angeles and the meaning of Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles, the angels, the city of angels, no? Uh, because I, when it was founded, this town, uh, it was called you know, El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles de Pursuncula, uh, because it, it was founded you know, by, the, by the Franciscan. And in fact, in, in, if you go to Assisi, you will find this, this uh, um, still this basilica of Our Lady of Angels of the Portuncola, no? where in fact Francis of Assisi, Assisi started you know, his, his uh, religious order. But I wanted to say something about you know, the, the idea of, uh, um, uh, of uh, Los Angeles as the city of angels, because it always reminds me of uh, uh, that passage from Hebrew uh, 13, uh, uh, chapter 13, uh, verse 2. Eh? Do not neglect, neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And I hope that we, we will continue doing that no, as Christians in our, in our global cities. Dr. Dochak. Good, good. Yeah, well, hopefully you can hear me. And thank you so much, Tim, again, for the invitation. Uh, and all of those at Fuller who made this possible, I know these were, uh, these are crazy circumstances. And uh, I would have, uh, as I said earlier, welcome a chance to be in California instead of South Bend, Indiana right now, but that's all right. It's been great to, to spend time with you all and to uh, listen to some amazing uh, papers uh, and such. And I think what strikes me uh, in terms of my immediate impression is I am a historian, a historian uh, I'm an academic, uh, to have the opportunity to hear from practitioners, from those who are really uh, kind of on the front line of uh, not just analyzing, but finding answers uh, for next steps, I think has been uh, not just refreshing, but, but invigorating as well. So I appreciate this opportunity to be part of uh, such an interdisciplinary conference. Uh, let me summarize, I think, what I think are uh, some of the, the takeaways for me. And uh, my father was a pastor. Uh, you know, he liked to uh, implement the uh, three points in a poem format. Uh, and I was never really good at poetry. So I uh, went to academia instead of uh, uh, the pulpit. But uh, three points quickly uh, that I think from uh, this kind of thorough study of Los Angeles as a crossroads. Uh, and uh, to, you know, again, follow in my father's uh, footsteps in his lead here, I'll, I'll offer three C's, other C's as, as a way to uh, kind of highlight the takeaways for me. And again, this might be more on the academic side of it and much perhaps more on a, 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 a kind of a re uh, engagement with Los Angeles and its history, its religious history, and 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 uh, its cultural and political. Well, uh, first of all, what struck me again is seeing Los Angeles as a crucible. Uh, this is a city always uh, kind of been on the leading edge uh, in which uh, relate power, whether they be along racial or ethnic lines or religious, religious and political, uh, have all been. Uh, stark, uh, if sometimes hidden, often hidden as well, but always kind of a test uh, of moving forward, be it for particular religious groups, uh, be it for the region, be it for the country as a whole. And I think uh, so many of the comments from uh, Dr. Romero to uh, Dr. Sexton's, who, uh, who's, uh, I think, reflections on Los Angeles, theological reflections are just beautiful. Uh, Joan Didion, uh, here it represented, I think, in, in his uh, in his rendering of Los Angeles. But uh, you know, lines such as disrupting narratives is what California does. I think really hits uh, hits the point here that I'd like how how important Los Angeles has been throughout 
100, 150 years for determining next steps. Uh, and it has come with, again, a rest uh, with power relations. Professor Kim highlighted that. Uh, and something that I think as historians, that we as practitioners uh, need to come to terms with and appreciate as well for trying to understand and, and navigate next steps. Secondly, a second C, LA is a caution. Uh, this has been a trend center uh, of backlash as well. And this is something that came up in our conversation uh, uh, when I was uh, talking about the southernization. Uh, I got the sense from uh, hearing the talks, reading through these papers, just of how urgent our time is, uh, how urgent, whether it be because of politics or socioeconomics, globalization, uh, Los Angeles is very much in the lead. And so uh, trying to wrestle with Los Angeles as a cautionary tale is also, I think, important uh, for, uh, you know, thinking about how we respond, uh, not just locally, uh, but uh, on, on a national global level. And again, I, uh, Professor Kassam, there's, there's other uh, illustrations of this, uh, but I only have uh, a remaining few moments. And the third C then that I drew from this is connection or otherwise put as Catholicity. Uh, and I love the, you know, Professor Kim's uh, talk and lecture on uh, kind of the liminality of, of Asian Americans in Southern California, I think speaks to an experience, a universal experience of uh, those who have settled, who have uh, found their way to Los Angeles uh, and have been marginal at some point. Uh, again, creating moments uh, and opportunities, unfortunate of friction, uh, but also of uh, seizing on those experiences of margin marginalization and liminality uh, to strike new connections, new opportunities uh, for working across denominations, for working across boundaries. Uh, and uh, I think that is also uh, a constructive and I would say the more exciting aspect of, of life in Los Angeles, something uh, that it can be a model, I think, and hopefully will be a model for other communities across the nation. So uh, I will leave it at that. I could say more, but thank you very much. That's great, thank you. Dr. Flory. And you need to unmute yourself first. Yes, I did. Well, most people don't say that to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I, I'm very appreciative of being invited to be part of this. My first impression is I'm really happy to see some friends of mine, even though your little tiny squares on my computer screen. And it's fantastic to see you all that I know and to see people I don't know. And I wish I could see you in person. Uh, but I think that, that's really important to me. Um, and my father, just like Darren, my father was a pastor, too. But I apparently didn't pay as much attention to the conclusions when he was preaching. Sorry. So uh, I don't have a snappy 3C thing, but uh, but I really appreciate that. That says something to me about coming from California and being distracted by lots of different kinds of things. Um, I think what, what overall, my, my comments are more sort of broad and general about this because I've been thinking about L.A. and religion for a long time and done some work on that. And, and I think in a lot of ways, the different presentations and, and discussions have solidified some of my ideas about Los Angeles and, uh, and religion in general. But it also caused me to think of additional issues um, that speak to the importance of Los Angeles. Now, uh, Alexia, in her response to my first talk was, she mentioned uh, Manuel Pastor from USC. And Manuel, I don't know if this is his favorite saying, but it's a really good saying. So I'm gonna steal something from Manuel and adapt it to us. And Manuel has said, and many times I've heard him say, California is America only sooner. And I think we can apply that to Los Angeles as well. Uh, Los Angeles is America only sooner. What we see here is gonna happen elsewhere. Whichever side of that equation it's on, whether it's the reactionary side or the progressive side or somewhere in the middle. Uh, when I was growing up in Southern California, the little suburb of Long Beach that I lived in excluded by covenant Jews and Catholics, but that, and that was in the 50s and early 60s. I'm not sure when that went away, but now it's an incredibly multicultural sit, little city, which is amazing to me when I drive through there. And it's really pleasant to see. So things happen, things are in motion as Darren talked about in his presentation. Um, and then the other part of this is, and this it reminded me of the of 
this. Yeah, yeah, I was reading the LA Times yesterday, and Gustavo Ariano has a column. He's a columnist now for the LA Times, and he had wrote this really nice piece about Latino leaders in other parts of the U.S. who grew up in California and are making California differences in those places. And that reminded me of Mel Robeck's metaphor for the for the, the importance of Los Angeles for the spread of global Pentecostalism as Los Angeles has, <laughs> I love this metaphor, the Los Angeles has the cue ball in a perfect billiards break that then impacts the entire world. And in a way that's possible because people leave LA. They don't just come here, they leave here. And then that reminded me of Juan Martinez's piece that in, in the Spirit and Power book I mentioned on global Pentecostalism. And there's one person, I do, do not remember her names because I've not read Juan your chapter in a while, but there's this one person in there that you talk about who, was, who ended up being deported back to Mexico and he was in Ensenada and it was completely framed in his mind as, oh, all right, God wants me to be in Mexico and I'll just start a church here. So that that idea that that uh, that self starter that 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 network of people that can do these things just because you can do them is is was solidified in my mind so so i really appreciate this opportunity to hear other people talk about similar themes and to expand my thinking about uh, about los angeles and religion and la's impact in the world mm, thank you dr flory dr kassam so first of all, I want to thank you for putting together a conference that is so timely, so topical. I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that, uh, you know, in a sense, what we've seen in the last four years is uh, self-inflicted wounds on the moral conscience of America, because uh, in the political establishment we've had, you know, migration has become such an embattled issue. Um, speaking, uh, you know, uh, about the ways in which uh, refugees who present themselves at our borders, the way that they're treated, the criminality that has been enacted, the separation uh, of children from their parents. Uh, speaking as a mother myself, I mean, that is just unthinkable to me that as Americans we would allow this, right, and allow it to go forward with impunity um, and legislate against it, uh, legislate in ways that uh, allow uh, uh, these kinds of things to go on. So um, the rich discussions that have ensued all week, you know, really t talks and speaks to the importance of this issue. So I do, I really, my heartfelt thanks for uh, putting on, uh, uh, making migration the focus of the missiology lectures this year. Um, and as several have pointed out, you know, LA is the perfect crucible in which to examine these issues because it is really a microcosm of the world, you could say. Um, there's just about every ethnicity represented here. Um, another thing that I, there was a big takeaway for me was uh, a panel discussion that I attended uh, yesterday that actually brought home the fact that, you know, we think of helping migrants and refugees as they're at the receiving end of this. But uh, I believe it was Im who talked about, you know, how Korean churches themselves are organizing to make huge contributions and helping themselves, but also, in a sense, integrating into the American, you know, marvelous quilt that is, you know, America. Um, and uh, this is a, something that is quite often forgotten, that, you know, we come from this attitude that, you know, they're helpless, they need our help, we should support them. But often not much uh, uh, attention is devoted to what migrant communities themselves do to enrich the landscape and the fabric of America, right? So this was kind of uh, a, a good takeaway for me to see that being exemplified. And the third was a very rich discussion this morning between uh, uh, professors uh, Sanchez and Crouch, you know, with respect to the taxonomy that Professor Sanchez offered. And again, there I couldn't help but think, you know, when he started talking about hospitality, I just love it when I can see resonances between our, you know, uh, mighty religious traditions, you know, this idea of the Prophet Muhammad, you know, escaping Mecca and the persecution there and leaving for Medina and uh, 
which was not called Medina then. Um, and he meets a band of people who are commonly known in the literature as the Ansar or the helpers. And they helped, you know, the fleeing community from Mecca to settle into Medina. And then they helped them with all kinds of organization, housing, food, meeting their needs, etc. And so this notion of hospitality to the stranger is so deeply embedded in the Islamic framework because it goes right back to our, you know, prophetic story that to see that hospitality being mentioned and talked about in the biblical frame, you know, made me see the resonances between, you know, the Islamic view uh, towards migrants and the, the Christian and Jewish view towards migrants, you know, reminding me once again that we are one family. Um, and also, I think all the different models that you put forward, uh, Professor Sanchez, in a sense, uh, you know, really brings home the fact that none of these can work without the assistance of the other. They are very interconnected, imbricated, they need each other. And, uh, you know, ending with the vocational impulse, I think, just nailed it. It was it was just marvelous. So that discussion was very rich, and I'm really grateful to have been able to have been witness to it this morning. I'll stop there. Great. Dr. Kim. All right, uh, I would like to share three main takeaways. I'm a list person, so I like to go one, two, three, like that. Um, first, this is an obvious one, but I really realized through the conference that there is no single uniform story or path of missions. Multiplicity, complexity, heterogeneity, hybridity, and innovation characterize how faith, migration, and transnationalism connect, especially in a global metropolis like Los Angeles. So that was very clear. And then second, racial and power inequalities affect, affect migration and missions, faith migration and missions in connection. It affects who we view as real missionaries, as real Americans, as real Christians, who we view as people in need of saving, uh, assisting, uh, versus doing the saving, doing uh, being the savior, and who we view as neighbors, as citizens, us, versus strangers, aliens, and the other whose culture history is viewed as normative, default, whose culture history is compromised, assimilated, and, and or erased, and who is ultimately excluded versus included, who is in versus out, who is seen, unseen, who is whose voices are heard, and whose voices are not heard. So as Christians, as missionaries, we really need to be aware of this for ourselves and the communities that we serve. So that really hit home for me. Um, and then third, despite these power inequalities, white supremacy, and the growing struggle against racial injustice, there is hope and agency among the various ethnic and migrant communities that we have discussed at this conference. With the creation of the Brown Church, with Asian Americans making their own mark within the broader Christian landscape and beyond. Uh, so right along with the theme of inequality and oppression, is the ongoing calls for, I noticed during the conference, for a common humanity, dignity, and evidence of people, faith pursuing justice and giving voice to the voiceless and being that change we all want to see in this world, right? Especially these days, uh, during these times. And this really hit home for me during the Chapel of Migration and Mission by Bishop Zach Nuringue. The dominant narrative missions is missions as domination. Missions from the position of economic, political, colonial power with all of the military metaphors of domination and overtaking the other. But right alongside that model, we also have the model of missions from below. Missions from, we have, we have missionaries as you know, possibly the migrants, pilgrims, fugitives themselves versus the colonialists. And that these migrants, fugitives, right, pilgrims, that they are the true bearers of Christ bearing witness, communicating the power of the Christ versus of Christ versus the power of the state imper or imp and imperial power to ultimately move hearts and minds and hope to accomplish the Great Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Martinez. Uh, I, I re I'm reminded by the city of Los Angeles as a crossroads and, and I saw everybody on, in, in, in boxes that I walked with, that I marched with, that I that I um, wrote with, that I pastored with, and I was grateful for that. Uh, I am uh, a being of 
uh, Spanish grandparents and ind indigenous grandparents. And as I say, my indigenous grandfather raped my indigenous grandmother. And there, here I am. And I think that is part of how we need to learn about Los Angeles. We will be mixed. We will come together. And uh, as, as we connect that, that way, we, we really need to consider what, what mission really is. And I, I, liked, I liked the words that each one of you used, that we have to think about the fact that we will be mixed that uh, Los Angeles will be the, the crucible and that we will, I've learned Korean. I've, um, I've learned to uh, march, uh, which was really, uh, I, have, I have a picture of me with uh, Archbishop Mahoney and I've never, saw, I've never uh, showed it to my, to my father who was a pastor uh, because I don't think he would be, very glad that I marched with uh, with Mahoney uh, in one of the marches here in Los Angeles, uh, and so that that to me that picture where we are crossroad and the picture that I see uh, on my screen, I know a lot of you people. Uh, I've like I said we've walked together, and I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful for the 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 connections, and I'm grateful for that that picture that uh, uh, Rick uh, Flory gave us about uh, us uh, being uh, uh, balls uh, that are going to, toward the, wor the world. Uh, I think that we are, um, and, and how the, the uh, people from Mexico and the South uh, are seeing the Border Patrol as mission agency because they have pushed the people back to, to their countries and they've gone with the message. They've gone with the fact that, that what they were learning here and they got gone back to, to their country. And so I think those would be the things that uh, were really cr crucial for, from listening to you, from the things that you have uh, done. And really, in fact, glo uh, Los Angeles is a global community and a global crossroads. And I think that would be the, the thing that I took out from all of this. Mm. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And I wanted to add that um, when he was uh, here at Fuller, before he moved to um, better places, he, um, Dr. Martinez was the one who helped to conceive this way of, um, of doing the conference with Los Angeles as a focus and uh, bringing together migration, transnationalism and faith. So thank you very much, Dr. Martinez. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, next is uh, Dr. Sanchez, I think. Yes, thank you. Um, so one of the questions that I uh, brought to the conference is uh, how my theology uh, and missiology benefit from all of the perspectives, right? The interdisciplinary um, uh, engagement. And uh, I learned a lot. I just want to say that. I, I want to, uh, to thank all of uh, my fellow presenters for their contributions. Um, I, I think the, the thing that uh, stayed with me was you have to listen to the stories. Uh, in all their complexity. Uh, it's not simply about having a theory about something, but it's about people on the ground. So the, the emphasis on place uh, with Dr. Flory and Doshuk and Sexton um, on geography, the materiality of the uh, migration experience as it relates to place uh, and bodies and, and voices. I, I think that's, that's very uh, important. Uh, my son is one of those who, who left for California uh, uh, to USC, uh, Interactive Media and Game Design, but is now currently in Missouri <laughs> because of the pandemic. So we hope that things uh, get better with that. Um, 
So listening to those stories, and then this really came home with presentations by Drs. Martinez and uh, Kassam, um, uh, Kim, uh, very much this idea that uh, in order to understand uh, migration rightly, you have to think of the migrants' voices and the moral agency. Uh, and I think that is a helpful uh, corrective, I think, to the way that uh, models of uh, theological reflection on migration uh, uh, think about things. Uh, because I think sometimes the, the models of theology of migration out there could work in a unilateral way. You know, they, they could work in a one-sided way. So for instance, uh, you might say, how can I be hospitable to the migrant? You know, so it's kind of one way. Or uh, what legal remedies do we need for migrants? Uh, the legal model, again, one-sided. Um, even transnationally, you might say something like, well, what, what relationship did a host nation establish with another country? So that then we can speak about the responsibilities of the host nations to migrants from those countries because of guest worker programs or because of a colonial or quasi-colonial historic uh, engagement uh, or invasion, however you want to look at it. Um, but that's still one-sided. That's always asking, you know, uh, what do we have to do for migrants? And I think even the vocational model of engagement could be one-sided, you know, where you say, well, how in my calling can I be of service to a migrant? And I think that narrative still sneaks and sneaks in, you know, uh, theologies of uh, migration. We have to be careful about, about that. Uh, we need to think more in terms of the moral agency of migrants, their own stories, and what they, on, in their own right, contribute to our uh, theologies. Uh, and I think, for instance, just to give you an example, uh, uh, I thought... Uh, 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 doctors uh, Campese, uh, emphasis on Catholicity was very helpful. It wasn't just hospitality towards, but it was, you know, how this culture of encounter uh, uh, highlights uh, the neighbors' contributions to the life of the church. Uh, you know, so Catholicity is no secondary to the nature of the church. Catholicity is of the essence of the church. Um, uh, and, and again, I think I, I, see, I see there a partnership language as opposed to just one-sided uh, language. And I think being part of this conference has allowed me to bring a critical lens to theological responses to migration that could potentially be used in dangerous ways if we're not thinking in terms of the moral agency of migrants and of telling their own stories. Um, and, um, and at the same time, having said that, we don't want to fall into a utilitarian framework either, where the only reason why I want to engage migrants is because they bring something to the table. I think we have to be careful about that kind of language too. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that both closed borders and open borders, uh, uh, people could be strange bedfellows when they only think of migrants in terms of things you can get out of them. <laughs> and I think that's the extreme, you know, of the one-sided uh, position. So that the reason why we like migrants is because of their labor contributions or their, their spirituality. I, I think here, the language of, uh, as Dr. Kim was saying, the common dignity and humanity and uh, Dr. Kassam also brought this up, uh, needs to also have a place in our conversations. Uh, so I've learned, I've learned a lot, and uh, you brought in some critical frameworks for me to uh, go back uh, to the gill and uh, uh, rock the boat a little bit. So thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you. Dr. Sexton. Well, that's great. And um, I think... Uh, Maybe I'll follow um, Rebecca and Darren with with three points. Uh, I, I think if I can, but but not to leave what uh, Dr. Sanchez just said. I mean, nobody wants to give up 
of the world cuisine that's in Los Angeles, uh, of course, and be utilitarian uh, as it may, uh, and how that fusions together when the Kogi truck comes a few yeah. um, from my place in Long Beach. But uh, I think I will start by, I, I've learned so much in this conference. I think it's so well conceived. All, every presenter and respondent brought so much to the table, and I'm looking forward to learning uh, from you all in even this next hour uh, that we have together. Um, but uh, up to this morning, uh, Dr. Sanchez's vocational model of migration, I think, um, had a lot for me to think through about, um, I think, what I need to revise in my paper and, and go back and do some more of that. Um, I think it complements the importance of knowing particular social histories uh, that need to be taken uh, into account, especially uh, with where Los Angeles sits in the world and the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, that that then gives way to what Michael Deere calls a third a third nation. People sort of caught in between, and, and Juan Martinez uh, in between this, um, which which then you know I think uh, gives us some reason to think from uh, think through our history. Uh, you know, with with what we've not only developed in this country uh, and our history as we face it, um, but also facing what happened in in Los Angeles with this ongoing logic of removal, uh, creating ghettos and, and policing and, and other things that have contributed to the current structure of where we are. Toward, and, and moving from this logic of removal that Willie Jennings calls to a to a hermeneutics of responsibility. Um, which I think needs to incorporate what Rebecca Kim has just mentioned this morning. You know, I think the notion of agency. You know, I think that that would that very much I think complements um, and might be the additional factor needed in um, Dr. Sanchez's model of, of migration, sort of agency. And, and um, Dr. Flory mentioned that as well in in, in his talk. Um, but I'm, I'm also in, and onto the second point, and these are not alliterated. Sorry, Darren. Um, uh, but my father was not a, a pastor. Um, uh, but this leads me to the question, I think, of, of with so many disciplines represented. I love hearing from the historians and the sociologists, from the missiologists. I love hearing the various biblical perspectives, um, theological reflections, uh, as well as from the activist scholars. Um, but it does lead me to the question with so many methodologies represented, it's the so what question. This is not my final point, but but the so what question I think is 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 one for I think critical inquiry here. Um, there's a lot represented here, but but what exactly are we saying um, within the spheres of what what's what's descriptive and what's prescriptive? Um, I, th I think that's perhaps uh, a, a framework for a, an ongoing uh, ongoing aspects of our conversation so far. And then I have a, another question I think is, is a bit more practical, um, not just about the disciplines or, or, or what we would do, but but what about, um, and I, I and perhaps I, I missed some of this, um, what about, and some of it's being teased out, I, I think so for, uh, today um, a little bit, but what about inter-ethnic congregations and, you know, I, I, I think um, some of the most, if not all of the presentations have centered people of color somewhat in the narrative uh, of what's happening in Los Angeles, but where is the place of inter-ethnic diversity? Now, California also has a history of that with Howard Thurman in San Francisco proposing sort of an inter-ethnic congregation that doesn't really work out. Uh, it's, you know, and, and, and so I'm wondering, and, and, and Rebecca mentioned this, already today, the, 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 the cultures. And I think um, some of this has been part of the experience in the, in the panel yesterday. I uh, don't think it all came out, but from um, Hey Pen M and those, you know, understanding what migrant uh, and Korean communities in particular, you know, which are, especially after the LA riots, perceived perhaps as one thing uh, in, in something of a journalistic narrative, uh, but is, is so much uh, more than just that one particular thing and keeps moving. Um, so, I, this is a, an ecclesial question. Um, what is the place of of, in, um, of interethnic congregations uh, in in Los Angeles? And um, to raise the question of, of cultural compromise, 
um, what is what is the place of of particular ethnic congregations in in Los Angeles, and how how does this work out? Not just as a descriptive narrative, but per perhaps with prescriptive options, uh, not just for what the church might continue to embody in Los Angeles in, in its particular uh, locatedness. Uh, but then that that brings us back to the question I think um, from um, Dr. Campese about the unity of the church in the midst of this plurality, and how to, and then and then what perhaps might then become um, prescriptive possibilities, maybe for the state if um, city planners and elected politicians are paying attention. I'm not sure they are, but um, we can perhaps start with. And perhaps make them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, before I go to Dr. Salvatierra, I want to go back to Dr. Campese, whose um, internet wasn't so good earlier, but probably has sorted itself out by now. So Dr. Campese, could you pick up where you left off? And um, Okay, but uh, yeah, you have to tell me because the angels left me suddenly. So where, where... <laughs> <laughs> this, when, when I was talking about the city of angels, no, I wanted to make, you know, I wanted to start uh, with this connection, you know, with this global connection between uh, the, uh, the city of angels that was founded, you know, by, by the Franciscan and Italy, you know, that where there is still, you know, this, this uh, you know, it's one of the, the well-known basilicas in Italy, uh, the, 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 the Our Lady Queen of Angels, and, and make this connection with somebody who really uh, understood, you know, in the 12th century, uh, the, the, um, uh, the idea of, of, of brotherhood and sisterhood, like St. Francis of Assisi, eh? who, who, who considered uh, all human beings as brothers and sisters, uh, no matter, you know, what was the, 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 the nationality, also the religion, and uh, also considered creation as brother and sister. Uh, that, that is, I think, is, is very uh, important. But, you know, uh, uh, the, the connection was uh, the, the City of Angels with the, the letter to the Hebrew, chapter 13, verse 2, and I read it again. Um, uh, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And I was saying, I hope that we will continue entertaining these angels. Uh, uh, we will, um, in our global cities, where there is so much diversity. And what I heard in this, during these days was really a diversity of uh, stories uh, about uh, migration, uh, a, a variety of approaches, uh, theological approaches, uh, to migration. Last but not the least, the one proposed by, by Dr. Sanchez. Um, a variety also of encounters uh, with migrants eh? um, and a variety also of understandings of mission. And this, is all, this is all material that I think that I need personally to digest. Eh? Uh, and I think all of us have perhaps to digest and, and, and read because it raises lots of questions. I will tell you what uh, really uh, concerns me at this moment in time, in this context, and it is the political dimension of mission. And, uh, uh, mission, and I say mission with the migrants, not to the migrants or of the migrants. I, I, I am very careful with the preposition mission with the migrants, because we do mission together. Uh, all the, 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 if all the baptized are, uh, are the missionary disciples, it doesn't matter if they are migrants or if they are not migrants, we, all, we do mission together, eh? necessarily. Okay, but anyway, what, what uh, worries me at this moment in time is the context in which we are talking about migration. Eh? And I am not talk just about, uh, the, the, talking about the fact that migration it has been politicized, uh, uh, you know, in not only in the USA, but everywhere in the world. Uh, and so it has become really a, po a political, contro a politically controversial issue. Well, it, it is to be expected. This fact is to be expected within society. 
What worries me even more is the fact that this uh, issue is causing division, is causing polarization within Christianity itself, within each one of our churches, within my own Roman Catholic Church. And it is really, I don't know, I, I, I cannot really um, uh, understand how, how uh, there are certain uh, church leaders, I, I will be very, very critical here, uh, I, there are certain uh, church leaders, uh, church movements uh, that are um, uh, justifying, are supporting political candidates that have been really, uh, you know, so negative about the whole issue of migration. You know, it, for me, that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. It, and, and it is not the question I will, I will you know, uh, it is the, the big elephant in, in the room. It is not just the question of Trump because now there is, you know, the, the, the elections in the USA. This is happening here in Europe, in my own country, eh? in, uh, in uh, Hungary, in, in other countries around the world where, you know, uh, these, uh, um, these political movements are laying claim to Christianity. Eh? You know, they are claiming Christianity for, uh, to uh, themselves. You know, they're saying we represent Christianity. At the same time, they are, you know, nationalistic, xenophobic. Uh, they have th th this also uh, uh, racial, you know, uh, uh, bad attitude, etc. This really worries me. What is our answer as Christians? To this, uh, to this uh, um, uh, idea of Christianity that is that is being sold, you know, that is being marketed, you know, around the world globally, what is our response to that? Wow. Yes, indeed. Um, and uh, Dr. Salvatierra is going to tell us. <laughs> what our response should be, I think. You've done such a lot of thinking and and, and also um, engaging in this area very practically. Um, right, I mean, I, I wasn't planning to respond directly to the question. <laughs> um, the advantage of being the last one on the list is that I get to respond to sort of the sum total right now of your immediate insights, not only what has happened over the last few days. And the phrase that keeps coming back to me is the phrase that I learned from Dr. Campese, although it comes from Pope Francis, which is the culture of encounter. That what we're talking about is encounters, all of us. Some of them, are, some of the consequences of those encounters are negative. Some of them are positive. Some of them um, have huge consequences. Some of them have minor consequences. Um, what we were just thinking, what um, Gio Acino was just talking about was the avoidance of encounter, but that in itself is another kind of encounter. What I was really struck by what um, Pope Francis said, as I understood it, is that these are all mystical encounters, that God is present as these encounters occur. And so that's, I think that is a sort of a response to the question that Dr. Campese just raised which is we always have to ask that question, where is the Holy Spirit already responding? And how do we ensure that our responses are actually in tune with that? Um, we, I often, you know, as someone who's worked on these issues for 40 years, um, I have ongoing images of the wilderness, of Moses looking into the promised land and not being able to enter. <laughs> um, and also of David and Goliath. Um, because we often feel like the light shines in the darkness and the darkness regularly actually overwhelms it. So the question is, you know, where are we in a David and Goliath moment where we have um, more power in the mystical quality of this encounter than we think that we do? Um, and what does it mean to receive that power and to move into it, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit at this historical moment? as we represent a very international group of people. You know, what, what are the seeds that we're sowing at this conference that will have fruit far beyond what we can see? How do we trust that and how do we encourage it as the conference ends? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, we have um, three uh, questions or I have three questions um, 
uh, that are uh, being raised from the conference that I'd like us to address. And I've for for the um, we have our own chat here amongst the uh, presenters. So I've just um, asked that those should be visible to the presenters uh, because if all nine of you um, try to respond to each question in turn we won't um, be able to finish this before 12 30 so um, I thought it would be helpful if you saw the questions and, and perhaps identified one that you that you think you can make a particular contribution to um, and we'll, we'll go through them um, uh, in order all of them are focusing particularly on 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 Christian mission um, and Christian engagement with migrants. Dr. Kassam, um, I would also very much like to hear from you at some point as to how this sounds to you as a Muslim, how you think other faith communities might feel about some of the things that Christians are planning to do or um, whether that your response is positive, negative, or, or whether this can be a collaborative effort and, and so on. Anyway, um, so uh, let, let us uh, start with the first one, um, the first question, um, which says, I'm, I'm curious about the migrants entering the US who view themselves as missionaries and how American churches can or ought to partner with them. So please speak up if you'd like to have a go at that question. I think Dr. Um, Bishop um, Nuringie raised uh, interesting issues, didn't he, around who exactly is the missionary um, in this scenario. And uh, I know I've been very conscious in Britain the last few years about the the number of people who are coming uh, from the US as well as from Africa and Asia and other places, seeing Britain as a country in need of um, evangelization. And, and uh, uh, that, that that's obviously the case here as well. So um, Dr. Salvatier, I think you indicated you'd like to say something. Yes, all I'd like to say is that uh, that's part of the work that we do on the ground in Los Angeles as Matthew 25, Mateo 25, is that we build those partnerships. Um, so I just want to say that it's happening hmm. and, and, there, and, and that we have learned, maybe I'll say one thing about it, is that we've learned how difficult it is to build those partnerships and that engaging the first generation, the sons and daughters of immigrants as bridges, we call them puentes, is an absolutely critical ingredient in being able to build the partnership. Hmm. So I just thought. Okay. Anybody else like to chip in on that, Rip, um, Dr. Kim? Oh, yeah. So that's that's a great question because, uh, as many of you may know, on this panel, the United States sends out the most missionaries in terms of raw number out to the world. But it is the number one missionary receiving country in terms of the you know hottest destination for missionaries, particularly from the global south. So definitely, we have folks moving into the country, uh, viewing themselves significantly as people that can help revive and bring faith back into this you know, secularizing country, poss possibly turning into a dark continent like Europe. So we can't do that. We have to prevent uh, the United States from uh, you know, losing its soul, if you will. So definitely we have a lot of uh, immigrants coming into the country as missionaries. And so in terms of how we could, how the churches can partner with these missionaries is to, I think, first of all, to view them as, you know, as they accept them as, as they are in the sense that if they see they are real Christians and they're missionaries, that you should take them seriously. Because I find that with a lot of, especially missionaries from the global South, the Americans, including folks in the American Christian Church, do not seriously view them as their, certainly as potential partners, but even as real Christians, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think at the beginning of the journey could be just um, accepting them, right, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as they are, and, and then, you know, with that, move towards possibly partnering with them as well. Yes, um, Dr. Kassam and then Dr. Sanchez. I think another aspect of this is also the fact that, you know, uh, all faiths are bringing their missionaries in through migration. So this is not simply just a Christian issue, even though within the Christian case, one could argue that, you know, there's also what then butts up against more conservative views, meeting more liberal views. 
And you find that replicated in other faith traditions as well, as they struggle with how to welcome the migrant, but also build bridges with the missionaries amongst those migrants that may bring social attitudes that are far more conservative than what we're used to in America in some quarters. So mm -hmm. that's all I'd say. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Well, I was thinking that uh, here, I think we need to move uh, away from just a, a, a merely a multicultural model of looking at this, where you say, well, we have different cultures kind of next to each other, alongside each other, but we never really connect. And I think that sometimes when you have migrants coming in whose calling is to be missionaries, uh, what ends up happening is the mother church might say, well, you do your thing over there and we'll do our thing over here and maybe we'll send you some money. Uh, uh, so that's really not sufficient because it's not really a Catholic picture. It's not even a picture, I think, of life in the spirit, uh, uh, you know, where we talk about... Uh, you know, not on, we do not only see the other as, as someone in need, but someone who has gifts. So I think we need to acknowledge the giftedness of the migrant um, and live according to that narrative, align with that narrative. And then that will have implications on how you, uh, uh, you know, bring him into the, the church. The cross-cultural model to me is not always helpful because the crossing usually goes from the side of the person with the gifts, so to speak, or the resources towards those who need our gifts and need our resources and need our theology. And so that doesn't take account of the migrants calling either. It doesn't honor it. It doesn't see it as a gift. So I think the intercultural uh, way of thinking is, I think, the, the best one here, because now you're talking partnership. And so we share in each other's burdens, but also in each other's um, joys and gifts uh, and, I, and I think it will require to move away from mere multicultural and cross-cultural language into intercultural language to, uh, to actually take seriously the calling of the migrant in his or her own right as a missionary. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, Dr. Sexton. Yes, I think um, perhaps some of um, Josiah Royce's uh, kind of regionalistic approach um, might might help us in this way because if, if we're talking about cities like Los Angeles and we're talking about a church that uh, that exists there and churches that are embodied and that are working hard and that know the place um, makes me think of a story of a of a, it's a California story it's an LA story um, of a well-known evangelist pastor of a large mega church in a suburb of Los Angeles um, very successful speaker, best-selling author, social justice focused, uh, uh, kind of uh, an evangelical superstar um, who sort of leaves everything and sort of a mystical kind of figure as well. Um, and a California figure from Stockton and, you know, but in LA and, and sort of goes around the world sort of with this vision of, of I, I'm not sure where, the Holy Spirit's calling me, but, and then lands in San Francisco and um, pulls a lot of money from all over the place. And I remember talking to people who worked in, in the mission and in and, and, and San Francisco about sort of what, what effect did this person bring here, um, who seemed to not work with uh, a lot of efforts that were, you know, going, going on there on, on the ground and, and some of the local, uh, uh, folks that, that had been there for a long time in, in uh, particular ethnic congregations and, and so on, and, and multi-ethnic congregations in San Francisco. Uh, um, this person, celebrity, even John Celebrity, didn't partner at all with us and sort of just drained resources and, and other figures that, that were helping. So I think here's where, you know, we don't want any um, uh, thinking about the particularity in this, of, of place and, and, and the stories and, and, and folks that have been working. I mean, we don't want to inf any, any more self-inflicted wounds, uh, as uh, Professor Kassim has, has mentioned, which I think can easily happen with um, what evangelicalism in particular uh, has done, of course, historically, uh, the church. And so perhaps that's a, um, a caution to be careful what we wish for, but also to, to reflect on particularities of, of what's already happening in, in local places and to, to be attuned to 
to those local manifestations of Christian work. Yes. And uh, if I might just add, before we move on to the next question, I think it's really good for local churches to um, begin to realize that other people might see them as in need of something. <laughs> um, and that, that, you know, that we're in all in mission to each other um, in, in this Catholicity of, um, of sharing um, and uh, ministering to one another. Uh, but I think, but very often, for, especially for Western churches, it's hard to receive from people who we've so often thought of as um, our um, inferiors in in some ways. So it, it, I, I would really like to highlight this aspect of um, uh, what's sometimes called reverse mission um, to to the West. That um, it can be really constructive for churches to understand themselves in that context. Um, so the second question is, most of the participants of the Azusa Street Revival, which we know as um, uh, in the origins of Pentecostalism, were migrants and enjoyed a koinonia, a fellowship, until Jim Crow's shadow overwhelmed, doctrinal and class fissures widened, xenophobia intensified, and the movement fragmented. Yet the 20th century was a pneumatic century uh, the questioner says, given the looming national fragmentation, how can history prepare us for faithful missions in the 21st century? Who would like to begin with that one? Dr. Flory. I, I think, and I understand this is in a Zoom chat form, question form, that kind of is not exactly, I don't think, how to think about the Azusa Street revival and how the participants and what happened. Um, I mean, what I would add to that, for example, is uh, what still happens in many churches: women do the work, men take the credit. Um, and uh, there's 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 a there's a line of 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 gender that needs to be addressed here as well. Uh, but I, I think this that question makes me think back to the issue of agency that a couple of people brought up. And as a sociologist, human agency is great, but we don't have as much agency as we think we do institutions constrain and allow us to do certain sorts of things. And, and we see that every day. And so my, my response to this is that, is in the form of a question, I guess, is what are the institutions, what do we want our institutions to look like, regardless of what you want as an individual? I mean, it, the, the reason that the religious right, just to put a political spin on this, because the uh, election is on, Tuesday, the reason the religious right is so powerful despite their declining numbers of white evangelicals in America is because of their institutions. They spent decades forming these institutions and or orienting them toward political power to get what they want and they've been successful. And so those, if you need to flip that around to this question is like, what do you want your institutions, your churches, your, your non nonprofit organizations, whatever to look like as they participate in, in, uh, in mission, in bringing people together and participation with each other uh, in collaboration and networks. Collaboration is really, really hard uh, because you have to share resources and resources tend to be scarce for religious groups. And so, I mean, that's, I don't really have a good answer for this, but I think it, it's in the form of a question is like, how do you form better institutions that actually are interested in the in the well-being of individuals. Mm. Okay. Next. I also agree with uh, Richard Flory, but in addition to that, I think in part the answer is in that question, which is I think that being able to understand our history as a whole and in part can help us to be, you know, more, you know, progress in the next century right. as far as how we're going to do faith and missions. So understanding our history, including how the institutions have connected and aligned and affected the people and their efforts to evangelize and mobilize as Christians, uh, that can take us a significant step forward in uh, that direction. Can I add just one thing, and because all of these conversations, it's so funny how they remind me of pieces of my life. And I, uh, several years ago, I was fortunate to be able to give a review of uh, uh, Darren Dochek's book on uh, uh, from Bible Belt to Sun Belt. And as and my comment at the time was, as I read the introduction, like, yeah, I was there, I was there, I was there, I was there, and all these I, I experienced those as a kid. So 
And on this agency and, and what, what Rebecca was just saying is like reflecting on history and why and, and how we might do things differently. So I, as I said, I was a pastor's kid. I went to a small Christian, evangelical Christian school that was in Paramount, what I like to call at the time, this was in the 60s and 70s, the land of scary white people with bikers and things like that that were out there. And literally there were people being across the street in the, in the apartments being hauled off by the police or uh, ambulances all the time. And they were all generally these kind of what I call scary white people. I can say that kind of like But purely by accident of geography and how demographics shifted in that area, my life changed because instead of it just being this white evangelical school for my whole formative years, it became, we started attracting uh, kids from Compton, from Linwood, from, uh, from North Long Beach. They, they were uh, Latino, uh, African-American. My first uh, African-American friend was in fifth grade, Everett. Uh, we became very good friends. Our families became very good friends. His dad tracked me over the years and would, when I'd see me in LA, I don't know how he found me. He would stop and we'd talk on the street. But that changed my life in one way to much more different viewpoint than I would have had otherwise. I have friends, people I still know today, who have gone with the absolute opposite direction. There's some of them are, are overtly racist, some of them are implicitly racist, and it's wrapped in their Christianity. But they have the same experiences, at least in my view, but there was a shifting. So my so I don't have an answer, but it's like, how do you reflect back on those personal experiences? And then help to put it, whether that's in an institution or, or just individually, and then learn from that and move forward in, in, a, in a more, for me, in a more inclusive and partnering kind of a way. I think that's an important self-reflexive thing that institutions need to do, that individuals need to do. And if we don't, then we just sort of start protecting whatever in the world we think we have. Mm. Um, Dr. Sanchez. Yeah, this is a very rich conversation. I, I appreciate that very much. I would also add to it the power of narrative, uh, meaning that part of the self-corrective uh, nature of institutions is that they have to tap into those narratives which they believe provide maybe a new vision or a restore vision of what life in the spirit looks like. You know, so Pentecostals themselves, and this is more of an encouragement, have to look for those narratives that align more with the Azusa Street uh, experience, which they do not see always reflected in their institutions today, you know, because uh, it might have been overtaken by a different story, <laughs> a different narrative that moves it. And maybe that's a political narrative. And maybe that has taken over, uh, you know, uh, the narratives that initially empower and nourish the movement. And so, you know, this is more of an invitation. Look at your own tradition and see what narratives, and not only uh, uh, what narratives, but even what models, right? So who are the people who embody that vision historically uh, or, uh, or today, you know, uh, that might uh, invite us to be a part of that story again? And, that, and I think that's an incredibly powerful uh, way to... Uh, revitalize institutions. And Dr. Campesi and, Dr. S and then Dr. Salvatierra. Um, uh, I don't know if I am too daring, but you know, I am, I am trying to reflect on how we could um, consider the, the, the time that we are living now, you know, with this pandemia, global pandemia, and, and what is the message there? And if, uh, uh, this uh, moment, uh, uh, this epoch in, in our history, which is so tragic, you know, that is causing so much death, suffering, especially to poor and vulnerable people, and to migrants, and to migrants in, in, in all over the world. You know, I, I don't know if this, could, uh, you know, I hope it could be a moment in which the spirit mysteriously could enter and tell us a few things. And, 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 you know, uh, and question the way we are doing things. Uh, question, because, you know, I hear often, you know, from people, you know, this, this desire to go back to normality. Uh, what kind of normality we were living before uh, 
before this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, it was normal that people would die in the Mediterranean Sea by the thousand and, uh, you know, and the governments would just let it happen. It, it is normal that people are in the detention centers and they're being tortured eh, just because they are migrants. It is normal that uh, parents and children are separated from each other. Eh? It is normal that, you know, millions of migrants are, uh, and refugees are living in miserable conditions in, in, in refugee camps. It is normal that, you know, uh, migrants in general, most of the times, you know, are exploited uh, from, from the po viewpoint of their, you know, their salaries, etc. You know, uh, I hope that this could be uh, uh, also uh, this moment, I don't know, in a mysterious way, because, you know, there is too much suffering to deal with. Uh, it is too, there is too much pain to deal with. But I hope it could become really a, a, a pneumatic moment uh, in our, in our uh, history that could cause conversion, you know, that, um, that could provoke conversion. Uh, so that we could have, we, we understand really that we belong to each other and we have to help each other and we, it, we, that we have to work together that we have to encounter each other even even with people we, we consider you know enemies because only in encounter and I go back also to what uh, Dr. Salvatiera was saying I think that only in encounter uh, conversion could happen. So Thanks, Dr. I'm going to take off my professor hat for a minute. Um, some of you know that actually I've been a community organizer for 40 years on a local, um, regional and national and international level. So I want to speak from that just for a minute. Um, and I want to share that I was one of the co-founders of the Evangelical Immigration Table in 2011. Um, when we started, 83% of white evangelicals were against immigration reform. And by 2013, 72%, um, I think, were for immigration reform. It was a moment in history. The table was very institutionally rooted. We had most of the major evangelical denominations as well as non-denominational organizations involved. Um, but now we're pretty much back to where we were in terms of the white evangelical world. So we won a huge battle and then we lost a huge battle. And that, in fact, has been my experience pretty much all my life, which is that the battle rages and you win and you lose and you win and you lose and you win and you lose. Um, what, what I would like to call for from all of you is more study of how we win when we win. More study of that interaction between the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I want to go back just for a minute to something that Reverend James M. Lawson Jr. talks about which is he talks about the story from Kings about the battle between the prophet and the false prophets where they build the towers of wood and then the divine fire comes down. And he says that organizing is building the towers of wood, but that no one controls when the divine fire comes down, except that it can't come down if there's nothing for it to burn. <laughs> so that's just his personal reflection. He was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. Uh, Dr. King called Dr. Lawson his theologian of nonviolence. So anyhow, I think there's a lot of study of what's wrong. I don't think there's as much study of this interaction between the piles of wood and the divine fire coming down. And um, I think that can't be a secular study because a secular study denies the divine fire. I think there needs to be some real reflection on how that happens and how, going back to the question, how the church can prepare for that and engage in it intentionally. I think we need to move on to question three. Um, I know uh, the questioner says, I know the conference was focused on Los Angeles, very localized in some sense. How about the global nature of Christianity more than ever in its history? In our multipolar world and polycentric missiology, how do we see migration and mission shaping and being shaped by multicentric polyphonic and hybridized Christian witness in the 21st century. And I, I'd like to give priority to those who haven't spoken yet, who may have earmarked this question. <laughs> um, Dr. Martinez, I don't think we've heard from you yet. Um, if you would like to say something to this. Well, a, um, Le uh, Leonardo and others spoken about the testimony 
I think Los Angeles was a testimony to others. Here is how we will look at uh, the, the issue of mission around the world. And I think I would want the, per the person who asked the question and others who were a part of this to recognize that this was uh, this uh, issue uh, lo looking at Los Angeles was a way of giving the testimony. This is the way it will work. This is the way the spirit has worked. This is the way, and again, because uh, Sousa Street was here and uh, how, how many people from here have gone out into the world that it will be a way of looking at, looking at uh, London, looking at uh, you know uh, 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 Tokyo, looking at whatever place you were you were looking at where you are working, and say these are these are the questions, these are the the way the issues will uh, interact with each other. This is the way that people uh, from various cultures will interact with each other and that that will be the question, that will be the way to answer the question. Uh, look at this, uh, of how we looked at it here and say, can we answer, can we answer these same questions somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Can we bring this same kind of people, uh, this kind of uh, program uh, somewhere else and say, yes, this is how we should answer the question. This is how we should look at the spirit and look at a, what um, Alexia uh, asked about what, what are we building? And so I think that would be the, uh, that would be the way I would answer it. A, Los Angeles as testimonial, Los Angeles as a place will be uh, the way that we would look at any other place. And so if it were Mexico City or Sao Paulo or, you know, whatever, whatever place we uh, name, this is the way we ought to do it. Thank you. Dr. Dochuk, did you have anything to say to this question? I've enjoyed, uh, appreciated the questions. Uh, thinking to the first one about the immigrant experience and, uh, as a product of uh, Ukrainian immigrants uh, who were uh, very influential uh, in the evangelical church in Alberta, Canada, I can say that there is a, a simpatico there between the, the immigrant experience and that evangelicalism. George Morrison writes about it in his book on fundamentalism of American culture. So uh, in terms of this question, I, I don't have much to add other than uh, that coming from from a, a historian of urban America in some regards. And I think what we saw in Los Angeles, as I mentioned, uh, highlighted in my talk, uh, was the creation of a new urban space, a new postmodern, uh, post-suburban space that I think was really distinctive at the time uh, that created particular opportunities for, for missions, for evangelism, for a particular kind of Protestantism to flourish. And uh, beyond the uh, international connections and flow that have come in and out of Los Angeles, uh, as uh, Dr. Martinez just highlighted, I think it's, it's in instructive to also understand the ways in which particular urban forms uh, in the late 20th century, early 21st century have replicated Los Angeles. Uh, Houston, now the most dynamic, most diverse, um, pluralistic community, a, a city in in the United States, very much like Los Angeles a generation or two ago, but going international as well to Brazil. Uh, so there, there's a way in which I think we can, as a, you know, again, a historian, a sociologist, an urban, uh, you know, working in urban studies, we can try to see how what Los Angeles produced and created, the opportunities it created are now being, uh, I think, replicated at least uh, internationally. So it's no wonder that uh, I think that we see this, this kind of dynamic the dynamic nature of uh, missions and Christian witness uh, flourishing in, in these other regions of the of the world. Thank you. Other contributions on this question, Dr. Sexton. I I, I think um, I, I agree in, in a lot of respects with um, what Darren just said and, and what um, Dr. Martinez said, but I, I, I'm a little worried. I know our focus has been Los Angeles, and that's where a lot of us live. Um, but I'm worried about 
and, and the dynamics here, I mean, these things are true, that the world is here. Um, and yet I'm, I'm, I'm worried about um, sort of romanticizing Los Angeles. Uh, you know, we highlight the strengths of, of what it is and the challenges and the way the challenges have been grappled with. But LA could go away um, within a couple of years if the water shuts off, uh, you know, if from the Central Valley that flows from, uh, from you know, from our, our major water source. I mean, it wouldn't take long. Um, and I think this is I mean, perhaps highlights what Los Angeles offers now. I mean, who knows what it's going to look like in, in 50 years? And we can solve and do all sorts of things and project ourselves in all sorts of ways and yet not deal with our real problems and, the, the, and, and really fi figure out things like the energy transfer and what's what's happening right now in our infrastructural issues underground with water um, being distributed uh, in equitable ways. And, and you know, with my colleagues at UCLA work on some of these, these questions about who's getting, who are being harmed um, for water prices and energy prices at certain times of the day. And it's often immigrant communities and there's very little being said about, about that. So I think there are some ways that LA is not a very good model. And, and yet perhaps what's happening in Los Angeles um, even gives us good reason to be looking at other cities um, for other models, even, even better models of, of the way migration has, has, has worked and the ways that various communities have have worked together, ecclesial and um, secular and, and other interreligious communities. So I think um, there's a cautionary tale about Los Angeles. Um, we can think critically about the place, but but the place also holds uh, resources to see where other places have, have even um, in more just ways dealt with some of the big questions that, that face LA today. Hmm. Dr. Kim. I'd like to add something as somebody, someone that has studied immigrant congregations, as well as the growing number of multiracial congregations. One pattern that I've noticed as a result of globalization or Christianity, if you will, particularly via migrants coming into the United States, uh, to various cities, um, is that the church has, has had to have conversations about what it is. So with more di cultural diversity, la language diversity, and different ways of worshiping, viewing Christ, organizing, building community, uh, we have had to have conversations, however, directly about what is the church? What should it look like? And what should it look like, especially when demographically, Los Angeles and beyond, we're, sh we're changing. Yes. Yeah, can I just, I, I mean, I just want to mm. chip, chip in here, and I think, I, I, I don't disagree at all with what's been said. And I think it's important to keep in mind that, that for me anyway, that thinking about Los Angeles, I'm neither negative nor positive about it. It's like it presents an interesting and important example of how things have worked culturally, religiously, politically, et cetera, because of the kinds of ways that it's been structured over time, the kinds of people that have been uh, attracted to come here, the successes or failures that they've had and things like that. So so I think the notion that I've talked about is about place and that has come up in a lot of other things. It can, be, should, can and should be applied in other situations. And I think then the comparisons can be made about, you know, whether you want to make them as good or bad. I, I, I don't feel as a sociologist, I, I'm in that business uh, of making the, the moral judgments about them. I'm, I'm certainly have personal feelings about it. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, I, I just just to point out the uh, the importance of of understanding the analytic side and why certain sorts of things have been have been encouraged by their association with Los Angeles. Uh, a few years ago, when I first met Juan Martinez, uh, we had a project in our shop on uh, global Pentecostalism, and then I had a piece of it that was on Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism in LA, essentially a hundred years later, what difference does Los Angeles make? Well, in, in a lot of ways, it's not, I mean, clearly it's not the center of Pentecostalism anymore, but it is an important place still. So to understand that shift over time and how, and then to ask the next question, which is how does it remain important? Um, but at the same time, there's as or more important centers elsewhere that are way more vibrant in terms of their uh, religious and, and, and spiritual uh, development and activities. 
I think the other thing, and this is not exactly related to this, is that I think is missing from most, most of, uh, and, and, and I, I'm going to make the theologians mad here, um, that, uh, that, that seems to me, uh, from my research and other ways, is that what's missing from most uh, primarily white-dominated evangelical and Pentecostal world, which ends up being the theology that mostly dominates most of evangelical and Pentecostalism, there is really no social theology. There's an individualistic theology that works with American culture. So I'm saved and I don't really care about anybody else. And so to get to this point of having these relationships of caring and collaboration, I think is really at root a theological issue for churches, but they have to present a theology of caring, a social theology of caring that gets you out of yourself to actually care about other people other than, you know, your five family members, because frankly, social focus on the family has won that battle. We are fo so inwardly focused. We don't tend to look out. And I've seen this in multiple projects that I've worked on and in different kinds of ways. And it's, it's troubling, frankly, uh, personally, that, that we are so uh, in hyper individual these days. And that, it, that, and I think that implies a significant problem for the kind of missiological conversation we're trying to have here. Thank you. Um, and on that sobering note, that challenging note, I think it's a very good place to um, end our discussion here because we, we haven't solved all the problems. Los Angeles offers some ways forward and it uh, has a very important part in the Christian story, especially. Um, but we've also heard uh, some of the cost that went into building Los Angeles and some of the downsides of this city. And we're looking to learn also from other cities and from other people from different perspectives and different parts of the world. So I want to thank all of our guest speakers for joining us. We're so grateful to each of you for sharing your time and expertise with us in this way.